This is part of the book. Uh, there are some, I'm bringing back on some other books that you were uh, able documents. And this one is a chapter by Alistair Thompson. And he says, History is the story we make out of stories we find. And basically, this is a good document. Five stories that people tell us, and we make sense out of it. We try to understand the person, the people who wrote it, and why did they write it. Because when we talk about on the history of historiography, it went through uh, many uh, changes in the last three or four decades. Because until, let's say, I think the uh, 1940s, 1950s, you have sessions of history. You have history of ideas, you have political history, and you have the sort of beginning work. You tend to be known as social history. But even social history was not the history of people. It was history of social movements, of ideologies, of interests. And this is because the effect of Marxism, Marxism on social history, and so on and so forth. We are not on it. We don't have to do it. But since the late 40s, early 50s, you see that you could talk about the term of writing history and that history concentrates on people. Uh, my good friend, Guru uh, Aloy, gave a talk to the scholars of the and he had a conference about the historiography of immigration. And, and he said, and I think he's right, that basically when you talk about immigration, the history of immigration, you don't talk anymore about the history talked about the history of, of immigrants, of people. Now, theoretically, we all know that uh, when we talk about uh, history writing, then you've got a subjective report on what happened. You can't trust it, as far as facts are concerned. So you don't use, or you hardly use, any ego documents to find out facts. What you do when you, you read ego documents, and we'll talk a bit about ego documents in different periods of history, when you talk about ego documents, you talk about the person, what makes him tick. And there is no wonder if you look what is happening to these ego documents in the last decade. Basically, those who are dealing very seriously with ego documents are sociolinguistics. People that are trying to make sense if a group in a certain mood of life, and the concept that may, mainly on immigrants going from country to country, do they have a sort of language that you could find out about their emotions, the way they think, etc., etc., etc. Now a bit about what, what is an ego document. It sounds very simple. An ego document is a document written by a person. Reflecting is, is what he wants to say. But actually, there are three kinds of, of ego documents. One is a diary. Somebody keeps a diary. And we, we tend to think that if one writes a diary, you write it uh, for yourself. But you don't. Because in the back of your mind, you are waiting that somebody will find it. You want to deliver some sort of emotion, but you cannot do it. And you hope that somebody that will find it will know what you thought about. And this is the very, the most intimate, because you write it basically, how do you want to be read by others? So, and, and it is not going to be soon. 
So you tend to be more revealing when you write about it. <coughs> the second one, for me, is the only one, because that's what I do. It's letters. But when you talk about letters, you basically got two kinds of letters. And I, when I talk later on on my, my research, I'll uh, give some thought about it. There is a letter that you write to somebody you know, and the letter that you write to somebody you don't know, but you need it. A letter to an official, etc., etc. Et and when you write those two kinds of letters, you uh, portray them uh, <coughs> in different ways. When you write a letter to somebody you know, historians read the letter. It's got some difficulty to find the subtext. It doesn't really know what the reader knows. But when you write a letter to an official, you have to give, to give as much facts as you need because you want to convince him to do something. So uh, it's, it's, you have to read those kinds of letters in a totally different way. And I will be, will be able to discuss it in, in our conference. In, uh, because I, I look at it not as a conference, but as a workshop. And I expect that we shall try to do, uh, do uh, to learn with it as much as we can. The third one, and I've got at least two people that are expert on it, Stephen Ball, is testimonies. Testimonies, it, it's, a, it's a bit of a problem because when you give a testimony, it's at least in some part, the one who runs it, the one who operates it, is the one who asks the questions. And the way he operates, within it is taking the evidence as its effect. So when we talk about the first and the second one, we talk about the one who did it, the writer. When we talk about testimony, it's not truly an echo document, but it's an echo document that the root is made by those who are asking the questions. So it's, it's a bit, and I, I hope that Stephen and Boaz, you will be able to give some thought about it, because I think it's, it's a different <coughs> way of, of understanding historical documents. Now a bit about the history of, of ego documents. So wh when the uh, historical research of ego documents began, really, it was in the uh, early 70s, and it was uh, mainly uh, a Dutch affair. Many of the researchers came from Holland. I did research on, especially on immigrants, but not only on immigrants. And, but the way they looked at ego documents is how do you write an ego, ego document where you are in a period of transition, when you go from place to a place. Nobody did ego documents when you are in the same place. You don't move. Your, your, your surrounding doesn't change. And this happened only in the early 90s. In the early 90s, more and more historians began to, to consider ego documents as a way of understanding daily life. Altax existe. That is happened when you live in the same place. And, and he had taken maybe two sources. One source was the German and the other was the French. Uh, historian Diana and others that, that mm -hmm. talked about the, the uh, living of people in the same place, not moving, because when you read a document of a person in moving, and the person that stays in the uh, same place all the time, it's a different way of looking at the documents, because life is different, let's face it. Uh, the question is, how do you do really ego documents? And there are two ways. One which applies only to current times. And this is oralist. 
And in all the story you got the way to, okay, you ask somebody, he gives you evidence, you talk to him, and then you can ask him, and he gives you more. But the other way, and uh, most of us are dealing with earlier periods, he writes, and he did, and it's done. So you can ask him questions, especially if you do Middle Ages. And, uh, and if you do the uh, late uh, 18th century, that's, uh, that's a lot of stuff. So uh, people uh, might think that uh, you don't have really a, a way to do echo documents as far as the far past is concerned. But it's not true. I'll give you just some uh, references. You know him because uh, when you wrote your uh, abstract, you gave uh, another paper of him, right? Of Decker. And this is uh, the way how he o offers a way how to deal with this uh, ego documents in history uh, since the Middle Ages. So you could see that people are, tr are trying, or tried at least, to, to deal with how to do it. Not in contemporary history. But in, in, uh, in current, <coughs> and he's, he's not the only one that does it. But this uh, this uh, uh, book and this introduction uh, is, is very helpful, I think, to, for those doing Middle Ages or even uh, 16th, 17th, and 18th century. It it's, it's getting a bit different in the 19th century, and, and I'll, I'll tell tell you why in a few minutes. historical research, so I'll say a bit about uh, dealing with my stuff, which is the Jewish family. And you've got uh, at least uh, two very interesting points of view uh, dealing with the Jewish family. The one that talks about the history, uh, uh, Jeffrey Redigal wrote about the Jewish family in Eastern Europe. He's a very nice guy. We've got one thing in common. We've got the same birthday. Uh, not a year and much older, but the same thing. Uh, and he writes about everyday life and the shtetl and within it. And it's a very new uh, article. In, uh, the one before us, Colleen. And he writes about how do I read documents of people in the Jewish family. But this is uh, this brings us to the thing that I'll talk in a minute, because I said it's about the same when you talked about the Middle Ages, 16th, 17th, 18th century. It's a bit different when you talk about the 19th century, and I'll try to explain in a minute more. And the other one is by uh, Natalman, who wrote about the First World War in a book edited by Gidon Gouveni and uh, and Medigan, uh, the female side of war <coughs> experience a memory of the great war in Italian Jewish women ego documents. So you see it quite a lot, and, and you've got quite a lot of uh, references in research to, to ego documents. But I think that the 19th century is a bit different. When, when we talk about written documents, and basically we talk about written documents before the 20th century, you have to remember that not everybody knew how to write, and not everybody knew how to read before the 19th century. During the 19th century, the ability to read and write grew rapidly. Uh, in the Jewish and non-Jewish society as well. And, and uh, you, for example, you hardly find any group of women writing before the 19th century, if you find any women, women writing, it's only from the elite you've got. When you're talking about American Jewish history, you've got the writing of Abigail Franz and others, but it, it's, it's not the rule, it's the exception. In, in, since the 19th century, being able to write, 
take a piece of paper, take uh, a pencil and write. It's much more common. So people that provide us with regular documents, the number is much bigger. The problem is that most of these documents are not held in archives, but in private collections. So if you don't have any uh, access to a private collection, you cannot really do the, the stuff. So it is uh, uh, very interesting, but I think that really uh, we could, uh, and I, I found those in a very cool glimpse, because there are much more information. Now the most research on Ego documents is in Ego documents via immigration. Because when you go from one place to another place, you are overwhelmed with many, many emotions. You find a new place with difficulty to adjust. <coughs> and, and you are frustrated. And you have to give this frustration to let somebody else know that you are frustrated. So reading ego documents while emigrating it is a totally different, uh, totally different. I'll just give you two examples of uh, <laughs> the one did with British immigrants to North America in the 19th century. Uh, by the time he, he uses the term British very uh, liberally because he refers to Irish and uh, Scots and not only to English. To Great Britain. And most of the documents he brings are either by Irish or by Wales. Very, very few by English, because the number of English immigrants was very small compared to. And then we've got uh, we've got uh, so title, and they are writing about the way the government <coughs> enter migration history. And those of you that do migration, I would very much recommend. It has to do with consciousness and awareness. So uh, two of the people who wrote about immigration, being aware of the, the process of immigration, understand what, what is an immigrant, how it does, it does work. I recommend very much those two. Uh, the one by Elliot and Gerber. Gerber is the Dutch who really started all this. this uh, and he writes uh, letter cross borders, practices of international migrants. The other one by Helbach and Rucker that does uh, German uh, German immigration, and and it's it's, a, it's different because the. Uh, uh, in one, people came from small places. In other, people came from large places, from cities, from... <laughs> it depends where you come from. And the German one really reflects... The way, it's in the same book, by the way. Uh, the German one really reflects the way that... It depends where you come from. Because usually when we do immigration, we deal with where you are going to and how it affects you. And this one, by those German, is the place you came from as, is as much important as the place that you are going to. So this is why I think that if you read those uh, articles, you will enjoy it very much.